I'm Laurie Hutchison, Executive Director of the Lobular Breast Cancer Alliance, and I'm very excited to welcome all of you to today's Advocate Chat, an introduction to cancer basic science and immunology, a conversation with Dr. Ramla Nering and Dr. Sasha Stanton. Now I'd like to introduce our speakers. Dr. Ramla Nering is head of partnering at Roche Diagnostics. Dr. Nering is based in San Diego, California and leads a global team across APEC, North America and Europe. She has a PhD in biology from the University of California, San Diego and did her graduate studies in molecular genetics at the Salk Institute for Biological Sciences. Ramla's professional experience includes the ability to drive strategy and partnerships with a significant experience in deal sourcing, structuring transactions, leading mergers and acquisitions, and licensing. Prior to working at Roche Diagnostics, she led the corporate development team at Foundation Medicine. She has spent a significant amount of time in the startup industry in San Diego and has focused her career on improving oncology patient care through access to novel diagnostic solutions. We are also thrilled that she is one of LBCA's board of directors. Dr. Sasha Stanton has an MD-PhD from the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York. She completed her residency in internal medicine at New York Hospital Wheel Cornell Medical Center and her hematology oncology fellowship at the University of Washington Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. She completed an immunology postdoctoral fellowship with her mentor, Dr. Mary Dysis, at the University of Washington Cancer Vaccine Institute and was promoted to assistant professor in 2017. Dr. Stanton mo moved to Portland, Oregon in January 2020 and is an assistant member in the Department of Medical Oncology at the Earl A. Childs Research Institute. Her research focuses on antigen discovery and vaccine design for breast and head and neck squamous cell cancer prevention vaccines. She's also interested in immune modification of the tumor immune environment of breast cancer. Her clinical work is with the Breast Oncology Group at the Providence Cancer Institute. Welcome to Dr. Nearing and Stanton, and thank you for speaking with us today. And without further ado, I'd like to turn the session over to Dr. Mary. Okay, so uh, very nice to meet everyone today and looking forward to this conversation. Um, as Lori said, I'm going to be talking about some of the more uh, basic science of oncology. Um, and I do have a disclaimer slide since I do work in uh, the diagnostics industry. So my disclaimer slide is here. This is all general information for your educational purposes. And I am not a healthcare professional, so I will not be giving um, specific healthcare advice. Uh, so to kick off, I think I will start by just giving you an outline of, of what I'm hoping to talk about today. I do realize that much of this is going to be fairly basic knowledge and so perhaps will be a review for people, but I think it's good to have um, a very strong foundation in understanding kind of the underlying um, processes that end up impacting cancer. So I'm going to go through today um, the background on uh, DNA, RNA, and proteins, the DNA basis of cancer, um, talk about tumor suppressors and oncogenes, um, the known genomic and molecular hallmarks of IDC and ILC, and then I'm going to spend um, a fair amount of time talking about the different types of diagnostic tests that are available in this space. So uh, looking forward to hearing your questions at the end of the session as well. So um, to, to kick things off, uh, I wanted to just talk about the, the very basics of how do uh, proteins get made in a cell and how does one cell become um, a lung cell versus other cells are your skin cells. So we have um, a basic set of information that's in every single cell in the body um, and in all living organisms, which is your DNA. And that DNA is a blueprint um, that would be uh, first transcribed into RNA and then made into proteins to differentiate one cell from another. So this uh, set of DNA essentially um, can make any cell any way that it, it could possibly be, but it's which uh, parts of the DNA are going to be read 
to be made into RNA, and then which of those pieces of RNA are going to be made into a protein that differentiate one cell from another in the body or one process from another um, in living organisms. And so um, every cell has that same core set of DNA. We often refer to it as A, T, Gs, and Cs. So those are the, the letters. So there are four bases or four letters of DNA. RNA also has four letters, but they're slightly different. They're A, U, G, and C. So instead of having thymine, um, RNA has uracil. And then proteins are composed of groups of those um, letters that are called amino acids. So um, if we think about the bu basic building blocks in the cell, we have DNA that's trans transcribed into RNA, which makes proteins which are made up of amino acids. And uh, many of the uh, molecular studies today refer to omics. And so I just wanted to touch on quickly, what are the different types of omics that you may be hearing about? Genomics is the study of the genome. Transcriptomics is the study of RNA or the study of the transcriptome, so the things that are made from DNA. And proteomics is the study of proteins or the study of the proteome. Um, and moving on from there, uh, in addition to uh, having DNA in all of your cells, that DNA is also packaged in a certain way. So we might think of um, like a picture of what we've seen as chromosomes under a microscope, which look like um, little fuzzy uh, X's. You can see, see that in the upper right hand side here. That's actually highly packaged DNA. So uh, DNA is actually more like a a thread or a very um, thin structure, and that DNA is packaged in a certain way to make the chromosomes. So in every um, person, we have 46 chromosomes, that's 23 pairs of chromosomes, um, and each of those chromosomes is comprised of DNA that's, as I said, packaged around something called a histone. And that package of the, the DNA plus the histone makes up the shape that we think of as a chromosome. Um, epigenetics is the study of how behaviors and environment change and affect the way that your genes work. So uh, when we think of direct genetic changes, um, that's going to be something that, that directly changes your DNA. Epigenetics are going to be changed what, your D, what parts of your DNA can be seen. So when you think about this uh, packaging of the DNA into chromosomes, that allows certain parts of the DNA to be read to make um, the RNA and certain parts to be hidden um, so they would not be able to be made into RNA. So when we talk about epigenetics or epigenomics, which is another one of the omics that's, that's coming up frequently now, um, this is uh, how that, that DNA may be made available for reading into um, a protein or into RNA and proteins, or it may be hidden and not be able to be available. And I'm giving all of this background so that we can get into um, kind of the meat of the discussion, which is um, mutations and the development of cancer. Um, so mutations are variants to your DNA, and um, they can have an impact on making a protein, making the wrong protein, or not making a protein at all. So you can see on the bottom right-hand side here, certain types of mutations um, would have no impact on the protein that's made, while others would either not uh, prevent that protein from being made, or they would make the wrong protein. Um, just a, a quick kind of well-known example of uh, variants or mutations would be what we've heard about in the COVID uh, times of the um, COVID Omicron versus Delta. Those are two different mutations that were carried on um, in the, the COVID uh, virus. And what's important about mutations is that they can um, lead to cancer. Um, so specifically, um, most cancers arise 
from dysregulation. And that dysregulation is usually caused by mutations um, in the DNA. So one thing that's really Im important to note here is that we're talking about mutations in what we, we refer to as somatic cells, which are the non-inherited cells in the body. So these are mutations that usually develop over someone's lifetime, um, and they're not going to necessarily be um, inherited or passed on from generation to generation because they're not part of your reproductive organs always. That, that would be passed on uh, to children, but they're, when we refer to somatic changes, they're not uh, hereditary changes. So um, just kind of setting the stage again on cancer. Um, cancer or neoplasms are an abnormal mass of tissue when cells grow and divide more than they should. Um, they can become, they can be benign or malignant and, and form cancer. Um, Carcinomas, which is, is what we're going to be uh, talking to about when we think about uh, breast cancers, are going to be formed in epithelial tissue. Um, so that would be uh, those things that are the uh, lining of your organs and internal passageways in the body. And uh, cancer emerges when um, cell division is broken. So it's essentially cells are able to divide out of control. And this usually happens um, because of changes uh, to your DNA. So that could be changes um, to the chromosomes. It could be um, an inherited mutation, as, as I was mentioning, so in the cases of BRCA1 and BRCA2. Um, and there are lots and lots of uh, genes in your DNA that um, can be related to cancer. There are over 500 genes related to cancer. Um, what is it that makes um, a cancer cell successful? So um, this uh, chart here on the right is called the hallmarks of cancer. This has been um, something that's been developed uh, probably over the last 20 years or so. And it's really, what are the signals and the areas of success that a cell needs to have in order to um, be a cancer, to become a cancerous cell. And you can also think of this as what are the uh, changes in the DNA that need to uh, support that cell becoming a cancerous cell. Um, so specifically, the most important thing is that the cell needs to proliferate or divide and that has to happen without an external growth signal. So most cells, um, are they only divide when they're essentially told by the body that it's the right time to divide. Um, so when cells become cancerous, they um, are able to have continued proliferation. They uh, can do this without, as I said, um, uh, having uh, growth factors. They resist death. So normally cells have a, a cycle where they um, multiply and divide, and then, but they also have a point in time where they die. Um, they're able to do this in an immortal way, so just to continue to divide. Um, they're able to recruit blood vessels, so induce angiogenesis or be able to uh, find a, a supply of, of food and oxygen. And they're able to invade tissues. So normally cells are supposed to live in one place. So the lining of your lungs should only be found in the lining of your lungs when they um, are able to uh, move from one location to another. That's another one of the, the hallmarks or the um, underlying uh, marks of success of a cancer cell. So on the, the right here is just kind of a, an overview of all of the things that I mentioned and a few others. I know some that came up in the, the questions that were sent in in advance is around the microbiome. So recently, things that were added to this hallmarks of cancer were inflammation um, and changes in the microbiome. And the others are kind of what I had already mentioned um, about uh, evasion of growth suppressors, changing the epigenetics, um, avoiding the immune system, immortality, um, and uh, uh, accessing blood vessels, um, just to, to name a few. But these are kind of the, the underlying success factors of, um, that make cancer cells a cancer cell versus a normal cell in your body. 
So what are the changes that happen um, in cancer cells that allow uh, this kind of um, this uh, success or the recruitment um, into becoming uh, a potentially um, a metastatic cancer cell? One of the main changes is to two types of genes called tumor suppressor genes and oncogenes. So in the kind of normal state, um, a cell would have both tumor suppressor genes and proto-oncogenes uh, present. And um, when there are uh, mutations made to those proto-oncogenes, or you could think of them as pre-oncogenes, um, those are usually gain-of-function mutations. And you could think of it, and this kind of cartoon up here shows that that, uh, that mutation or that change switches from being um, a car that had uh, not very much gas in it to one that has a, kind of the accelerator on all the time or it's always moving forward and it's able to um, to replicate without the need of growth factors. The, the, on the converse of that, the tumor suppressor genes normally act as a break or um, a regulation so that cells are not able to divide and proliferate. And so when there's a mutation that happens to a tumor suppressor gene, that's usually a loss of function or it prevents that, that gene from doing its function, which would be stopping cell growth. So it's removing the break when you have um, a mutation to a tumor suppressor gene. Other important genes that um, are, are part of uh, the evolution of cancer are DNA repair genes. So when you have a mutation in a D or a change to a DNA repair gene, that is essentially a failure at a point in time for the cell to stop and to um, repair those parts of the DNA that may have been damaged, say by um, sun exposure or by um, exposure to a chemical. And so those new, new mutations that are made from those external sources um, start to accumulate over time and they're not uh, repaired. So examples of some of these um, BRCA1 and 2 are DNA repair genes. Um, P53 is a tumor suppressor gene and um, oncogenes uh, include RAS, MYC, and HER2 new. Um, just uh, some names that you, you may or may not have heard. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention is uh, treatment resistance and um, how uh, mutations may allow for treatment resistance. Um, so there can be two types of treatment resistance. One is intrinsic resistance and the other is acquired resistance. Um, both of these would be uh, related to um, mutations that would exist in the, um, the population of cells within the tumor. Um, if they're uh, on the right hand side, you'll see in the picture, the top um, row indicates um, a tumor that would have intrinsic resistance. So you can see a, a population of mixed cells. Um, when the, that tumor would be uh, treated with a, a chemotherapy agent, you can see that the majority of cells um, uh, are killed or disappear represented in the gray, but some cells are able to um, to uh, survive the, the chemotherapy. So those cells would be selected for. And you could, then this would be intrinsic. It would not be caused by the chemotherapy, but there essentially would have been um, a clone or a set of cells um, at, in the original tumor that would be resistant to that uh, chemotherapy agent. Um, on the, the bottom here would be acquired resistance. So essentially there would be a change that happens in uh, some of the cells once they're treated with a certain um, uh, chemotherapy type agent. And that change would be an advantage for those cells where they are able to, uh, to grow or to evade that treatment. So that's essentially a beneficial mutation that would be um, uh, caused by the exposure to that um, chemotherapy type agent, and it would allow for um, changes to that cell to be successful and to be able to, uh, to have drug resistance. 
Um, I also wanted to, to mention some of the molecular changes that are unique to um, ILC and to IDC. Um, so uh, I know that many of these will, will be known to the people on this call, um, but just wanted to, to highlight that there are very uh, specific um, hallmarks or um, important changes that are unique either to IDC or to ILC. Um, you can see here on the, the right, um, the, uh, the top um, panel represents a lobular or ILC. The bottom uh, panel represents um, ductal or um, IDC. Um, specifically, the changes that are unique to each cancer type, there is um, most uh, lobular cancers have a change to ECADherin or the protein CDH1. This can either be a mutation or it can just be a lower amount of that protein being expressed. So less of it being present, but it's not always associated directly with a mutation. Um, additionally, um, ILCs are usually luminal in their molecular subtype and um, positive um, for both the estrogen receptor and progesterone receptor, and also HER2 negative. Um, and they're more likely to be lower grade, grade one and two versus ductal tumors. Um, there are a lot of unique molecular fingerprints that have been seen in, in lobular tumors, in addition to CDH1, including um, FOX1A and others. So here on the right, this is uh, from a, a recent scientific publication, and I do have um, all of uh, my um, the information from where these uh, came from, including the papers in the notes. And so um, Mason can provide uh, those for, for anything, uh, any questions that you have after um, the talk today. But on the right hand side here, this is showing specifically um, a view of ILC versus IDC and some of the specific molecular changes that are seen between those two uh, cancer types. So um, it's ILC on the x-axis and IDC on the y-axis. And um, mutations are seen as uh, green and um, amplifications or enriching of a specific gene are seen in red, just to, to give you um, a view here. So you can see that in the ILC quadrant, um, some of the the genes or um, chromosomal changes are highlighted here, including um, FOX1A, uh, TBX3, and then that zoom in of the, the smaller portion, um, it also shows PIK3CA and CDH1 being very highly associated with ILC versus um, IDC being more associated with MYC TP53, and um, another important gene, uh, GATA3. Um, we know that uh, FOX1A uh, in particular uh, plays a role in progression and endocrine resistance. So I'm going to change um, gears a bit from here um, to talk about uh, some diagnostic testing in um, in ILC and also just generally in oncology. Um, so the, the different types of testing that I'm going to touch on um, include uh, prognostic tests, therapy decision tests, um, molecular subtyping, and patient staging. Um, generally speaking, um, diagnostic testing in oncology can either be done um, on blood samples or on uh, tumor samples. Um, and it, there can be uh, tests that look at uh, your DNA, your RNA, or your proteins. And those are usually um, combined with some type of algorithm or predictive um, model for, for what that means of that combination of biomarkers that are being um, looked at. One thing I wanted to mention is that tests can be done in a research setting, which is called usually research use only. They can be done in a, a laboratory um, setting, which is called a laboratory developed test, or they can be uh, 
performed as a medical device. And across that spectrum from research use only to laboratory developed tests to medical device, there's an increasing amount of clinical evidence that has been generated. And so medical devices generally have the highest level of clinical evidence. And um, as a result are often those that are going to be included in guidelines. And I realize I'm just about at my time, so I'm going to go through this pretty quickly so that we don't run out of time. Um, the first uh, type of testing I wanted to mention is hereditary genetic testing. So um, cancers can either be hereditary, familial, or sporadic. Most cancers are sporadic or not necessarily from a, a, a specific um, uh, thing that can be tracked. Some cancers are famil familial, which means that they run within a family, but there isn't uh, an associated uh, genetic change that is seen and shared among that family. And then the third type of cancers are those that are hereditary in nature. Um, hereditary cancers make up 10 to 15% of cancers. And um, in breast cancer in particular, there are four genes that are usually tested for BRCA1, BRCA2, TP53, and CDH1. Um, BRCA2 and CDH1 would be the genes that are most um, often associated with lobular carcinomas. Um, importantly, uh, hereditary genetic testing is something that needs to be ordered by a physician, and there's usually a requirement for genetic counseling uh, for both the patient and potentially for their family members if they need to have follow-up testing. Um, I also wanted to mention prognostic tests. Um, I think most people are familiar with these. Um, these are commercially available tests, which are often medical devices, um, and they assess uh, which patients would benefit from um, chemotherapy uh, following uh, tumor resection. And they also can help with identifying the molecular subtype of the cancer. Um, one note is that unfortunately, most prognostic tests in breast cancer have been um, developed um, for IDC, not for ILC. And that's because um, most of the work in ILC has been retrospective in nature, and this is uh, due to the, the long timing between um, diagnosis and relapse or recurrence. However, um, although that is the case and most of the work has been retrospective, there is still um, a, been successes seen in using prognostic tests in ILC, um, and particularly in identifying patients who would be in a higher risk category of ILC. There also was, um, in the last few years, a specific uh, lobular uh, signature that was developed. Um, this is not yet available as a commercial test, though. Um, one of the other tests I was going to mention was tumor profiling. And specifically, I was talking about um, tumor profiling is, is looking at those somatic changes, so those acquired changes over time. And it can help with thinking about which therapy, therapy is either appropriate or not appropriate for, for a patient. So as I was talking about that acquired resistance, there are going to be some therapies that are not appropriate based on the molecular changes within a patient. It can also um, help with specific diagnosis of one disease versus another. Um, and most uh, tumor profiling tests um, look across all or much of the DNA and many of the types of changes uh, that are, are found within the DNA of, um, of a specific uh, cancer. It, it can be done on either the tumor itself or uh, can be done from a blood draw to look for um, circulating fragments of that tumor that would exist in the blood. Um, a few things that I wanted to mention in terms of kind of future looking, these are not um, really clinically validated today, but are more in that research stage, particularly in breast cancer, but I wanted to mention them. So the, the tests that I um, already talked about, hereditary cancer testing, prognosis testing, and tumor profiling, most of those are available as a medical device. They have high levels of um, clinical validation and are included in um, many oncology guidelines, including those from um, ASCO and NCCN. 
Um, the two that I'm going to mention now are, as I said, more in the exploratory um, phase, but it's minimal residual disease testing. And then the last one I'll touch on is non-invasive early cancer detection. Both of these would use um, a blood sample and um, MR, MRD testing or minimal residual disease testing um, is looking for uh, populations of cells that would exist after potentially a, a curable surgery. So you're looking for the micrometastatic cells that would be undetectable by imaging. Um, people are, or labs are developing these tests today um, by either looking at uh, peripheral blood, so for a circulating tumor cells or circulating uh, tumor DNA, or um, uh, disseminated uh, tumor cells that might be within the bone marrow. Um, as I mentioned, each tumor has its own kind of signature. And so there's also the um, possibility that these could be, um, that these types of tests could be made specific for a patient and the fingerprint of their DNA to track um, their tumor changes over time. And then the last um, two, or, uh, test that I wanted to mention, this is kind of the future look, and this is where we would love to see things going, is non-invasive early detection. So we have er early cancer detection for colorectal cancer from uh, stool-based testing. And now there are labs and researchers working on um, looking at blood-based tests that could be used across uh, different tumor types. And this would be a test that could look potentially at any of those biomarkers that I mentioned at the beginning, um, epigenetics, DNA changes, RNA changes, or proteins. Um, but this is unfortunately still an area that's uh, pretty much in the research stage. And so um, still a, a big future of uh, clinical evidence that needs to be developed here before they are really um, in the market. So I'm going to stop there and I will pass it, pass it over to Sasha. So I'm going to be switching around and talking about your immune system and your immune system in the context of sort of how a cancer sees it. Um, to, to do something completely different. Um, so what we used to have in oncology um, has been sort of our three um, cornerstones, chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery. Um, we've had surgery in oncology since the ancient Egyptians. They've actually found women um, mummies with mastectomies. Um, we've had radiation since the early 1900s. Chemotherapy came around about World War II um, and mustard gas, basically. Um, and then um, we, ah, ha, ha, there we go, we added immunotherapy. And that really is sort of where we're coming today. So I'm going to start sort of very broad because um, I'm going to be using a lot of words that people may not um, be as familiar with. Um, we really have two types of immune system in our body. And our immune system is here for the purpose of, there are many, many, many different structures of it, lymph nodes, we're all very familiar with that. And basically it is a layered system to defend our body against um, outside, outside um, attacks, viruses, bacteria, um, uh, all of those things. Um, and so basically the big core of this is you want your immune system to say, this is you, we don't attack it. And people who have a lot of autoimmune diseases, that, that is one of the problems is that your body sees something and thinks it's, it's foreign and it's you. Um, and also then to keep your body running healthy. So the innate immune system is first on the beach. It's um, the when you cut your hand and you get redness and pus at the site of an infection, that, that is your innate immune system. That is um, cells recognizing that, that um, there's something wrong and then going in to try to amplify the immune system. What then develops is an adaptive immune system that I think of as the Navy SEALs of the immune system. They are very, very um, specific B cells and T cells that recognize small pieces of uh, a, um, a virus or a bacteria or a cancer cell and specifically are able to target that and not just broadly cause inflammation. 
Um, we first saw this in um, the 1900s when we were um, learning about um, uh, smallpox. And uh, they were recognizing that there was a certain proportion of people, um, particularly uh, milkmaids that worked with cows that didn't get smallpox. And the reason this was, was they were getting cowpox, which is very similar to smallpox, and basically self-vaccinating themselves. So um, similarly now, we give you a tiny piece of that COVID, that COVID virus in the vaccine, and that is aimed to allow you to, your immune system, particularly your T cells, to see that virus, remember it, and be able to attack it if you actually see the COVID virus so that you don't get as sick. So when we're talking about the innate immune system, again, the innate immune system, nonspecific, it doesn't have antigens, we'll talk about what those are. Um, you don't develop immune memory, but it is immediate and transient. So for anybody out there who's gotten chemo, who had to get new Lasta because everyone was worried about your neutrophils, your neutrophils are part of this innate immune system. They, first on the beach, they release all sorts of inflammatory chemicals, and that's why they need to be at a certain level so that your immune system can keep monitoring your body for any invaders. The adaptive system, very specific, B cells, T cells, they recognize a specific antigen. They take time to develop. They develop over time, but they can develop memory, and then um, you can actually have lifelong immunity against things. These are key players. This is really just for your knowledge. I don't expect you to remember everything. I am today going to talk about T cells and they come in two flavors. There are helper T cells, CD4 T cells, um, and cytotoxic T cells, CD8 T cells. The cytotoxic T cells are what we call the killer T cells. That may be another thing you hear. CD4 T cells are, um, well, I'm also a CD4 T cell biologist, so just take that with a grain of salt, but they are the cells that help induce an immune environment and really get the CD8 T cells to work the way they're supposed to. And these are all of your innate immune cells. If anybody is a is, is a, a asthmatic, mast cells and basophils and eosinophils are not your friends. So you've probably heard those words said before. This communicates. An antigen. An antigen is a very small piece of protein that is presented in a self-context. So um, I like to think of this MHC class one and two, which you're going to hear about, a lot like you get a type of red cell, your A, B, O, minus or plus. Similarly, your MHC class one and class two, and that will just depend on whether or not you're getting your, your um, activating CD8 or CD4 T cells. Those are from your parents, just like the red cells. They're a white cell type. And in this context, this tiny piece of an of a outside protein can trigger your T cells. Your T cells are told activate or don't activate based on this, con this lock and key context. So a T cell receptor and an MHC receptor looking at this antigen that they both recognize. So a receptor is basically how cells communicate with each other. There are both this T cell receptor, but there's also activating, suppressing receptors, and we'll talk about those a little bit. Those are immune checkpoint inhibitors, for example, or immune checkpoints. And then there are cytokines, which are just chemicals that, again, the immune system is telling the, the T cells or the B cells or the innate system how they want to respond. So these are just giving you examples, breast cancer examples, Antigens can be HER2, they can be TROPE2. We're gonna talk a little bit about that. Receptors, we all know our receptors, ER, PR, HER2, that's what that R is for. They're, they all tell the, they signal the cell how to grow. Um, and then cytokines, Neulasta, GMCSF, that, that thing that brings up our neutrophils when we're getting chemo, that is a cytokine. So just to try to put that in real world context. And then we look at the tumor immune environment. And the tumor immune environment is complex. One of the questions we got prior to, um, to the, the talk was, how could somebody have a estrogen receptor positive tumor in their breast and a triple negative tumor in their lymph node? And the reason this is, is that none of our tumors are a monolith. We have tumors, even our tumor cells have multiple different genetic mutations and changes to them. And so something that 
So if you have an estrogen receptor positive tumor in your breast, but some of those tumor cells were triple negative and able to avoid that therapy, when they go to your lymph nodes, they could be, we call it discordant, it is rare, but they could be a different type in, in your lymph nodes. There are um, immune infiltrates that come throughout the, the tumor cells. There are lymphocytes and vessels that go to the tumor cell, as well as cancer-associated fibroblasts, which I will not be getting into today because that was one step too many. Um, and so we really get this balance. We want to get tumors that the immune system really sees and, and sees as foreign and infiltrates. And we'll talk about why that is important because this type one immune response, this, this inflammatory immune response, it, it prevents blood vessel growth. It can activate those CD8 T cells that can be directly cytotoxic, as well as some of the innate cells that can directly kill a tumor, like natural killer cells and um, um, macrophages. And it can induce that memory, that immune surveillance. Um, unfortunately, typically with our tumors, because they're self and our body is saying, why would we attack ourself? Um, they develop typically much more of a type two immune response. That is where you will hear these regulatory or FOXP3 T cells. Those are basically the cops. Those are T cells that say, whoa, whoa, this is us, don't, don't attack. And they make the environment such that, that the, uh, the, the CD8 T cells don't function well in it. Um, B cells, which make antibodies, kind of are, we used to call them, when this slide was made, it used to be considered that they were immunosuppressive. That is changing. Um, and, and so basically these are typically what our tumors see um, is your tumor is more of a wound that needs to be healed. And so it induces this, this anti-inflammatory immune response. Um, and, and, un and unfortunately that doesn't allow the immune system to really recognize and, and fight the tumor. So we have been doing a lot on looking at the tumor immune environment. Um, if you go to any ASCO San Antonio, you're gonna hear a lot about hot tumors, cold tumors, ignored tumors. This is basically what that means. Um, hot tumors are, you've got a lot of immune cells there. Um, these are probably the tumors that then we could treat with immune therapy by itself or treat directly with immune therapy and it would be effective. We have cold tumors where there's a lot of immune cells, but they're on the outside of the tumor. They're not inside the tumor. And so there's something in this tumor that's, that's keeping the immune system out. And we have to figure out what that is. And then we have these ignored tumors, as you can see here. So, so the tumor is in blue, the immune system is in green. This is, there's nothing around there. These are tumors that are very good at saying, keep moving and the immune system can't go there. We used to think breast cancer were all these cold or ignored tumors because a lot of our breast cancer cell types, or a lot of our breast cancers don't have immune infiltrate. As I will show you, um, this is actually a little more complicated than that, um, but that is this is where vaccines or giving T cells to a person might help because now we can introduce immune cells that the tumor can see um, and, and, and make cold tumors hot tumors so that things like immune checkpoint inhibitors and other, other immune therapies will help. But actually, so, so when I started working in breast cancer and saying I wanted to do a breast cancer vaccine, I had people tell me I was nuts because breast cancer is a cold tumor. Why would you work on it? Um, but I was a breast oncologist, so I, I wanted to work on breast cancer. And then we really started looking at tumor infiltrating lymphocytes and find out that breast cancer does have immune cells. There is a small group of breast cancers that have a lot of immune infiltrate and specifically triple negative tends to have the most. Um, uh, we'll talk a little bit about lobular right at the end, but we have not done the same immune evaluation of lobular. I hope that will change very soon. Um, my R21 is hoping that will change very soon. Um, but basically, um, uh, what this is looking at is literally the pathologist looks at an H&E slide and says, how much immune infiltrate is in this tumor? Is it over 50%? Is it 10%, 20%? And what you're seeing here is the first study. These were in patients with local triple negative breast cancer. Um, so, so they were having surgery and then doing chemo and whatever else they needed to do. And you can see that the patients who had over 50% infiltrating tumors um, 
over 50% infiltrating T cells into their tumor had a very good um, response over five years as compared to the patients that had nothing. Now you have to assume this is not going to be 50% or zero. Um, and, and that led to them living longer, uh, doing better overall survival as well as disease-free survival. Um, so um, Dr. Adams, who's up at NYU, um, said, okay, how much infiltrate improves outcome? And again, this is just in triple negative, but you can see with each 10% increase, so zero versus 10 versus 20 to 40 versus 50 or above, um, you can see that, excuse me, I'm going the wrong way, zero, 10, 20 to 40, or 50 and above, you can see that you get a both improved disease-free and overall survival. Again, specifically in this triple negative subtype. So I then said, all right, great. What about our other subtypes? Because the vast majority of our patients and the vast majority of our lobular patients are not triple negative. So what about our ER positive, our HER2 positive? We really don't, we're still trying to figure out those those other subtypes. Um, we're getting some idea. We know that elevated uh, lymph uh, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes into triple negative definitely improve both disease-free and overall survival. And we've also found that increased CD8 T cells, those are those killer T cells, improve disease-free and overall survival. In hormone receptor positive patients, that's not the same. But what we tend to see in hormone receptor positive patients are much more of those stock T cells, those regulatory T cells that slow everything down. And, and those actually have a negative prognosis. This slide is getting old um, because in HER2, we've actually now really shown that TILs, increased TILs improve response. Um, but we're also now showing CD8 T cells. So we need to figure out with our other two breast cancer subtypes, but we do know in triple negative, that the higher the till amount, the better that is. Well, that's great, but how many people have high tills? About 20% of triple negatives. So we have a lot of our breast cancer patients that we really need to understand the immune environment better for. And I know chemo sounds like it's this big immune depleter, but we actually have, and all I want you to get from this is not looking at all of the, the, the gobbledygook, but we are looking at the immune system and how it's affected by chemotherapy. And I've put arrows on sort of the top chemos that we're gonna see a lot in breast cancer. They do have a known role in activating the immune system because if you think about it, chemotherapy kind of busts open your tumor cells, lets the immune system see a lot of things it might not have seen in the past and that allows your immune system to really see your tumor. All right, so we've got multiple different types of immune therapies in cancer, and these can include nonspecific stimulation. So again, remember, this is your antigen-presenting cell. Those are typically in the innate immune system. They present an antigen in the context of the T cell, and there are nonspecific immune blockades. There are the immune checkpoint inhibitors. These are just receptors. These are, are I call them the breaks on the tumor, on the T cell. They basically say stop or go. They tell the, they, the these say stop. They basically tell the, immune, the T cell, eh, nothing to see here, move along. Um, and the immune checkpoint inhibitors, um, Keytruda, well, we can, I, I think my next slide gives you all of the different name, the different brand names, will block that, um, will block that receptor, um, either the PD-L1 or the, either the PD-1 or the PD-L1, which is either on the tumor or the antigen presenting cell, and allow that T cell now to be active because it's not getting that stop signal. Um, antibodies, um, uh, this is an antibody, HER2, Herceptin and, and Progetta are antibodies, and I'll show a little bit about that too. And then cytokines, things like IL-2, IL-15, um, these are still in trials, but as ways to enhance, amp up your immune system. Then there is specific response by your own immune system. That is just like the COVID vaccine, giving your immune system a, um, a specific piece of protein that we can get T cells to recognize that will recognize your tumor. And then there's passive uh, passive um, immunity, which is basically giving you an already amped up T cell that can attack your tumor, either your own T cell 
or, or your T cell taken out of your body, activated up and given back to you. So immune checkpoint inhibitors. I think based on time, I'm gonna move to just saying that basically where immune checkpoint inhibitors work is either at the t at, in the lymph node at the T cell, um, this is ipilimumab, CTLA-4, less used in breast cancer. This is much more used in melanoma or at the cancer cell where the T cell is seeing the cancer cell. So cancer cells overexpress PDL1, which is that receptor combo that touches with PD1 and turns off, makes the T cell less active. And um, if you have this antibody, if you have this PD1, PD1 or PDL1 antibody blocking that interaction, then you can get the T cell being able to work and actually attack, recognize and attack that cancer cell. And these are the poop of ladder of, of checkpoint inhibitors that you probably have seen. Really the big ones for us to think about is um, from Keynote 522, which is the, the neoadjuvant study, triple negative. It is giving women um, uh, Keytruda along with chemotherapy prior to surgery, and then you have some that you continue afterwards. And then also the Keynote 355, which is the pembrolizumab for women who have a PDL1, remember that increased stop signal on their tumor. Antibodies. So um, this has become big excitement. Um, and if you come to any of these recent um, uh, trial at uh, recent uh, San Antonio or or um, uh, or uh, or um, ASCO antibodies. Whenever you see them in science, they're written like this. Why they are very specific. They recognize a specific receptor, and they can both block it and induce immune response um, through recognition of NK T cells, macrophages, and even. Uh, allowing t increasing T cell responses. So one of these, two of these antibodies that have been best studied are Herceptin and Pergetta. And we know that Herceptin has both an immune response and uh, blocking that receptor like Romla was talking about, basically keeping that cell from growing and signaling in her to overexpress disease. Um, and we know this because when we take off this FC receptor, this is in mice, not in humans, um, we see that th that Herceptin is not as effective um, because we've lost the immune portion of that antibody. And we see that patients that are treated with Herceptin have um, developed more T cells and those more HER2 specific T cells induce a, a more effective outcome, more, more effective disease-free survival. What has come up recently, um, and I'm really just going to touch on this briefly, is that we've tied chemo to antibodies. This is only in the metastatic setting, um, but the big one that everyone's been talking about is in HER2, or fam terastuzumab derex tecan, which is why we call it in HER2. Um, and basically, this is a HER2 targeted um, antibody that brings along a chemotherapy um, and tries to very target, drop the chemotherapy in a targeted way at the site of a tumor. Now, what everyone's been talking about is these HER2 low expressing tumors. And the reason that in HER2 works specifically for these is that it's sort of like a suicide bomber. And I will say AstraZeneca does not support me describing it this way, but it brings the chemo to an area and then releases it. So it not only hits the tumors that are HER2 expressing, it also can give chemo to the area around them. So if you think about that tumor that has some HER2 expression and some not HER2 expression, it can release the chemo at that spot. Different than that is things like TDM1 um, and Trolldevi. Trolldevi is against trope 2. Um, TDM1 is another HER2 therapy, and basically what they have, they have this chemo tied right to the antibody. So it brings it specifically to a HER2 expressing cell, brings it in and releases the antibody inside the cell. So that is why you're hearing about this HER2 with HER2 low, and it got a standing ovation at, at ASCO last year, um, but that is the antibody drug conjugate. It's basically tying chemo to an immune therapy. Vaccines. 
I'm gonna go through this fast, but this is of course my love. Um, vaccines are getting small pieces of DNA or protein or cancer cell, teaching your immune system to see them and induce an immune response that won't attack a normal breast cell, but will attack and destroy a tumor. That's, that's basically what a vaccine is. Um, we have types of vaccines. We have the neoantigen vaccine. So if we go back to Ronla's talk, we have a chromosome with our, with, that is DNA. And if there's a mutation in that DNA, that can make a protein that has a mutation in it. And an mRNA, oh, sorry, a, a mRNA that has a mutation in it that makes a protein that has a mutation in it. If we can find those proteins that are recognized by a T cell, we can put the specific mutation in that MHC um, T cell context and induce a T cell specific immune response. So it's a small DNA change that is big enough that the immune system can recognize it and destroy it. That's different from vaccines that are against overexpressed proteins. Um, so um, I'm into prevention. It's hard to do a neoantigen vaccine in prevention because we don't have as many conserved neoantigens, small mutations as say myeloma um, and, excuse me, melanoma and um, lung cancer. So um, what we see with overexpressed proteins, this is looking at T cells in patients with one plus, two plus, or three plus HER2. We've seen this with HER2, even with untreated patients, there's more of a T cell response. But um, with many proteins, we, we want to induce the T cell response we want. We don't want your body to see an induced tolerance. And with overexpressed proteins, often there's small pieces of antigen, epitope is just antigen, that the immune system that is outside the tumor cell just because these proteins are overexpressed and that that um, that um, can be seen by a T cell and develop an immune response. There's also adoptive immunotherapy. And I don't know if anybody's heard, um, there's a project lead story um, because Dr. Rosenberg um, at the NCI is really the big proponent of this, where you take a tumor, you fragment it out, and then you grow up the, the T cells that are in there and you pick the T cell that will attack the tumor and you give it back to the patient. So one of the, there was a breast cancer patient at Project LEAD who had this done um, and they actually took the mutation T cells. So T cells that recognize mutations in her tumor, gave them back to her and she actually had a complete response for several years, which is very exciting. This is still very investigational. You have to go do a clinical trial to do it for breast cancer, but there are many, many types of adoptive immunotherapy now, um, including vaccinating first and then giving back T cells that were developed by vaccine, um, which we have done in the DSIS lab up in Seattle, um, uh, looking at the T cells in your tumor, which the NCI is still doing. Um, this is mostly in, 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 in metastatic patients again. And then now what we're even doing is we're doing modifying T cells. So we take out your own T cells, we give them a T cell receptor that will specifically recognize something on your tumor. We give them activation signals so that they get all activated and unhappy and ready to attack the tumor. And then we give them back to the patient. And so these are CAR T cells or T cell receptors. Um, and, and you'll hear a lot about that. There's, there's a lot going on in that, um, both in breast cancer and, and, and in a wide variety of cancers, particularly these cold tumors that don't have a lot of immune cells. All right, so now what about lobular? I don't have a ton of time. So um, lobular, we really, we when we've done these studies, we have not separated out lobular for the most part. And we've looked at the immune system for the most part, but we're starting to do that. Um, and so these are some of these earlier signs of this. We see actually, when we look at the TCGA and, um, and uh, Metabric, which are two very large genomic data sets of breast cancer, um, we see that the patients who have lobular breast cancer have a higher expression of immune transcripts by RNA-seq than, than ductal patients. So the immune system sees, seems to be seeing lobular more. Um, and you can see this, this is actually um, looking at um, uh, immunohistochemistry um, of lobular cancer and looking at a bunch of different um, types of immune cells. 
CD, if you see CD anything, that's an immune marker. CD45 just means any immune cells. CD8 are those cytotoxic T cells. CD20 is a B cell. And FOXP3, those are what make antibodies. And FOXP3 are those stop T cells, those regulatory T cells. LCIS, again, we LCIS is pre-lobular cancer. Um, they didn't subtype it in this paper. Um, I know we know there are subtypes of level of LCIS now. Um, but again, you can see that you get some immune infiltrate in LCIS, it increases in um, invasive lobular. Um, but I have to say um, the number of um, the number of of immune cells of of, of immune cells in in any of these, particularly immune cells that are in the tumor, are, are low. Um, a lot of immune cells on the outside, a lot of these excluded immune cells. So they did actually try to look at subtyping and see how subtyping of lobular would um, could predict um, a, a, a till valuation of lobular could predict outcome. So this is actually um, uh, looking at uh, 149 lobular as compared to 807 ductile um, to compare this trial. So in this trial, not a ton of tills, but less tills, so less tumor infiltrating lymphocytes in lobular, which seems flipped from the genomics of more, more immune transcripts in lobular. Um, and most of these, this is only lobular now, most of these were in either hormone receptor negative or two positive tumors. Now, why didn't they separate those out? Um, probably they didn't have enough because of the num how few e ER negative and HER2 positive lobular tumors there are. Here it gets tricky and we need more studies for this um, because when they looked at the percent till and look, these are low, it's zero, or less than 5%, less than 10% or greater than 10%, they actually found that it, more immune infiltrate predicted a lower, a higher risk of having breast cancer come back in lobular. And we don't know why that is um, because we don't know anything about these till. All we know is that they are um, uh, T cells or they are, they are uh, immune cells in the tumor. What we have to figure out now are what are those till? Are they all these stop till? And is that why they're, um, they're not having as good of a response? Are they all FOXP3? Um, we tend to see FOXP3 with ER positive. Most of our lobulars are ER positive. We ha really have to figure that out. And that is where we need more work um, and, and hopefully can, can get more work um, uh, going on as we uh, going forward. All right.